And tonight we are reading Farmer Giles of Ham by J.R.R. Tolkien, part two. What about the King's Knights? People began to say. Others had already asked the same question. Indeed, messengers were now reaching the king from the villages most afflicted by Chrysophylax, and they said to him as loudly and as often as they dared, Lord, what of your knights? But the knights did nothing. Their knowledge of the dragon was still quite unofficial. So the king brought the matter to their notice, fully and formally, asking for necessary action at their early convenience. He was greatly displeased when he found that their convenience would not be early at all, and was indeed daily postponed. Yet the excuses of the knights were undoubtedly sound. First of all, the royal cook had already made the dragon's tail for that Christmas, being a man who believed in getting things done in good time. It would not do at all to offend him by bringing in a real tail at the last minute. He was a very valuable servant. Never mind the tail, cut his head off and put an end to him, cried the messengers from the villages most nearly affected. But Christmas had arrived and most unfortunately, a grand tournament had been arranged for St. John's Day. Knights of many realms had been invited and were coming to compete for a valuable prize. It was obviously unreasonable to spoil the chances of the Midland Knights by sending their best men off on a dragon hunt before the tournament was over. After that came the New Year holiday. But each night the dragon had moved, and each move had brought him nearer to Ham. On the night of New Year's Day, people could see a blaze in the distance. The dragon had settled in a wood about 10 miles away, and it was burning merrily. He was a hot dragon when he felt in the mood. After that, people began to look at Farmer Giles and whisper behind his back. It made him very uncomfortable, but he pretended not to notice it. The next day, the dragon came several miles nearer. Then Farmer Giles himself began to talk loudly of the scandal of the king's knights. I should like to know what they do to earn their keep, said he. So should we, said everyone in ham. But the miller added, some men still get knighthood by sheer merit, I am told. After all, our good Agideus here is already a knight in a manner of speaking. Did not the king send him a red letter and a sword? There's more to knighthood than a sword, said Giles. There's dubbing and all that, or so I understand. Anyway, I've my own business to attend to. Oh, but the king would do the dubbing, I don't doubt, if he were asked, said the miller. Let us ask him before it is too late. <laughs> Nay, said Giles. Dubbing is not for my sort. I am a farmer and proud of it, a plain honest man, and honest men fare ill at court, they say. It is more in your line, Master Miller. The parson smiled, not at the farmer's retort, for Giles and the Miller were always giving one another as good as they got, being bosom enemies, as the saying was in ham. The parson had suddenly been struck with a notion that pleased him, but he said no more at that time. The miller was not so pleased, and he scowled. Plain, certainly, and honest, perhaps, said he. But do you have to go to court and be a knight before you kill a dragon? Courage is all that is needed, as only yesterday I heard Master Agideus declare. Surely he has as much courage as any knight. All the folks standing by shouted, Of course not! And, Yes, indeed! Three cheers for the hero of Ham! Then, Farmer Giles went home feeling very uncomfortable. He was finding that a local reputation may require keeping up. 
and that may prove awkward. He kicked the dog and hid the sword in a cupboard in the kitchen. Up till then, it had hung over the fireplace. The next day, the dragon moved to the neighboring village of Quercetum, Oakley, in the vulgar tongue. He ate not only sheep and cows and one or two persons of tender age, but he ate the parson, too. Rather, <clears throat> rather rashly, the parson had sought to dissuade him from his evil ways. Then there was a terrible commotion. All the people of Ham came up the hill, headed by their own parson, and they waited on Farmer Giles. We look to you, they said, and they remained standing round and looking until the farmer's face was redder than his beard. When are you going to start? they asked. Well, I can't start today, and that's a fact, said he. I'm a lot on hand with my cowman sick, and I'll, uh, I'll see about it. They went away, but in the evening it was rumored that the dragon had moved even nearer, so they all came back. We look to you, Master Agideus, they said. Well, said he, it's very awkward for me just now. My mare has gone lame, and the lambing has started. I'll see about it as soon as may be. So they went away once more not without some grumbling and whispering. The miller was sniggering. The parson stayed behind and could not be got rid of. He invited himself to supper and made some pointed remarks. He even asked what had become of the sword and insisted on seeing it. It was lying in a cupboard on a shelf, hardly long enough for it, and as soon as Farmer Giles brought it out in a flash, it leaped from the sheath, which the farmer dropped as if it had been hot. The parson sprang to his feet, upsetting his beer. He picked the sword up carefully and tried to put it back in the sheath, but it could not go so much as a foot in and it jumped clean out again as soon as he took his hand off the hilt. Dear me, this is... <clears throat> Dear me, this is very peculiar, said the parson, and he took a good look at both scabbard and blade. He was a lettered man, but the farmer could only spell out large uncials with difficulty, and was none too sure of the reading even of his own name that is why he had never given any heed to the strange letters that could dimly be seen on the sheath and sword. As for the king's armorer, he was so accustomed to runes, names, and other signs of power and significance upon swords and scabbards that he had not bothered his head about them. He thought them out of date anyway. But the parson looked long, and he frowned. He had expected to find some lettering on the sword or on the scabbard and that was indeed the idea that had come to him the day before. But now he was surprised at what he saw, for letters and signs there were, to be sure, but he could not make head or tail of them. <clears throat> there is an inscription on this sheath, and some uh, epigraphical signs are visible also upon the sword, he said. Indeed, said Giles. And what may that amount to? The characters are archaic and the language barbaric, said the parson to gain time. A little closer inspection will be required. He begged the loan of the sword for the night, and the farmer let him have it with pleasure. When the parson got home, he took down many learned books from his shelves, and he sat up far into the night. Next morning it was discovered that the dragon had moved nearer still. All the people of Ham barred their doors and shuttered their windows, and those that had cellars went down into them and sat shivering in the candlelight.
But the parson stole out and went from door to door, and he told to all who would listen through a crack or a keyhole what he had discovered in his study. How good Adjudius, he said, by the king's grace, is now the owner of Cardamordax, the famous sword that in popular romances is more vulgarly, vulgarly called Tailbiter. <clears throat> Those that heard this name usually opened the door. They all knew the renown of Tailbiter, for that sword had belonged to Bellomarius, the greatest of all the dragon slayers of the realm. Some accounts made him the maternal great-great-grandfather of the king. The songs and tales of his deeds were many, and if forgotten at court, were still remembered in the villages. <clears throat> this sword, said the parson, will not stay sheathed if a dragon is within five miles, and without doubt in a brave man's hands, no dragon can resist it. Then people began to take heart again and some unshuttered the windows and put their heads out. In the end, the parson persuaded a few to come and join him, but only the miller was really willing. To see Giles in a real fix seemed to him worth the risk. They went up the hill, not without anxious looks north across the river. There was no sign of the dragon. Probably he was asleep. He had been feeding very well all the Christmas time. The parson and the miller hammered on the farmer's door. There was no answer, so they hammered louder. At last, Giles came out. His face was very red. He also had sat up far into the night, drinking a good deal of ale, and he had begun again as soon as he got up. They all crowded round him, calling him Good Agideus, Bold Ahinobarbus, Great Julius, Staunch Agricola, pride of Ham, hero of the countryside. And they spoke of Cod Codamordax, tailbiter, the sword that would not be sheathed, death or victory, the glory of the yeomanry, backbone of the country, and the good of one's fellow men, until the farmer's head was hopelessly confused. Now then, one at a time, he said when he got a chance. What's all this? What's all this? It's my busy morning, you know. So they let the parson explain the situation. Then the miller had the pleasure of seeing the farmer in as tight a fix as he could wish. But things did not turn out quite as the miller expected. For one thing, Giles had drunk a deal of strong ale. For another, he had a queer feeling of pride and encouragement when he learned that his sword was actually tailbiter. He had been very fond of tales about Bellomarius when he was a boy, and before he had learned since, he had sometimes wished that he could have been a marvelous and that he could have a marvelous and heroic sword of his own. So it came over him all of a sudden that he would take tailbiter and go dragon hunting. But he had been used to bar bargaining all his life, and he made one more effort to postpone the event. What, said he, me go dragon hunting in my old leggings and waistcoat? Dragon fights need some kind of armor, from all I've heard tell. There isn't any armor in this house, and that's a fact, said he. That was a bit awkward, they all allowed, but they sent for the blacksmith. The blacksmith shook his head. He was a slow, gloomy man, vulgarly known as Sunny Sam, though his proper name was Fabricius Gunkenconctator. He never whistled at his work unless some disaster, such as frost in May, had duly occurred after he had foretold it. Since he was daily foretelling disasters of every kind, few happened that he had not foretold, and he was able to take the credit of them. It was his chief pleasure, so naturally he was reluctant to do anything to avert them. He shook his head again. I can't make armor out of naught, he said. 
and it's not in my line. You'd best get the carpenter to make you a wooden shield. Not that it will help you much. He's a hot dragon. Their faces fell. But the miller was not so easily to be turned from his plan of sending Giles to the dragon, if he would go, or of blowing the bubbles of his local reputation if he refused in the end. What about ringmail? he said. That would be a help, and it need not be very fine. It would be for business and not for showing off it at court. What about your old leather jerkin for an agedius? And there is a great pile of links and rings in the smithy. I don't suppose Master Fabricius himself knows what may be lying there. You don't know what you're talking about, said the smith, growing cheerful. If it's real ring mail, you mean, then you can't have it. It needs the skill of the dwarfs, and with every little ring fitting into four others and all. Even if I had the craft, I should be working for weeks and we shall all be in our graves before then, said he, or leastways, in the dragon. They all wrung their hands in dismay, and the blacksmith began to smile. But they were now so alarmed that they were unwilling to give up the miller's plan, and they turned to him for counsel. Well, said he, I've heard tell that in the old days, those that could not buy bright hauberks or out of the Southlands would stitch steel rings on a leather shirt and be content with that. Let's see what can be done in that line. So Giles had to bring out his old jerkin, and the smith was hurried back to his smith. There they rummaged in every corner and turned over the pile of old metal as had not been done for many a year. At the bottom they found, all dull with rust, a whole heap of small rings, fallen from some forgotten coat, such as the miller had spoken of. Sam, more unwilling and gloomy, as the task seemed more hopeful, was set to work on the spot, gathering and sorting and cleaning the rings. And when, as he was pleased to point out, these were clearly insufficient for one so broad of back and breast as Master Agedeus. They made him split up old chains and hammer the links into rings as fine as a skill could contrive. They took the smaller rings of steel and stitched them on the breast of the jerkin, and the larger and clumsier rings they stitched on the back. And then, when still more rings were forthcoming, so hard was poor Sam driven, they took a pair of the farmer's breeches and stitched rings onto them. And up on a shelf in a dark nook of the smithy, the miller found the old iron frame of a helmet, and he set the cobbler to work covering it with leather as well as he could. The work took them all the rest of that day, and all the next day, which was twelfth night and the eve of the Epiphany, but festivities were neglected. Farmer Giles celebrated the occasion with more ale than usual, but the dragon mercifully slept. For the moment, he had forgotten all about hunger or swords. Early on the Epiphany, they went up the hill, carrying the strange result of their handiwork. Giles was expecting them. He had now no excuses left to offer, so he put on the male jerkin and the breeches. The miller sniggered. Then Giles put on his top boots and an old pair of spurs and also the leather-covered helmet. But at the last moment, he clapped an old, felt hat, an old felt hat over the helmet, and over the mail coat, he threw his big gray cloak. 
What is the purpose of that, master? They asked. Well, said Giles, if it is your notion to go dragon hunting, jingling and dingling like Canterbury bells, it ain't mine. But it don't seem sense to me to let a dragon know that you are coming along the road sooner than need be. And a helmet's a helmet, and a challenge to battle. Let the worm see only my old hat over the hedge, and maybe I'll get nearer before the trouble begins. They had stitched on the rings so that they overlapped, each hanging loose over the one below, and jingle they certainly did. The cloak did something to stop the noise of them, but Giles cut a queer figure in his gear. They did not tell him so. They girded the belt round his waist with difficulty, and they hung the scabbard upon it. But they had to carry the sword, for it would no longer stay sheathed unless held with main strength. The farmer called for garb. He was a just man, according to his lights. Dog, he said, you are coming with me. The dog howled. Help, help, he cried. Now stop it, said Giles, or I'll give you worse than any dragon could. You know the smell of this worm, and maybe you'll prove useful for once. Then Farmer Giles called for his gray mare. She gave him a queer look and sniffed at the spurs, but she let him get up, and then off they went, and none of them felt happy. They trotted through the village, and all the folk clapped and cheered, mostly from their windows. The farmer and his mare put as good a face on as they could, but Garm had no sense of shame and slunk along with his tail down. They crossed the bridge over the river at the end of the village. When at last they were well out of sight, they slowed to a walk. Yet all too soon they passed out of the lands belonging to Farmer Giles and to other folk of Ham, and came to parts that the dragon had visited. There were broken trees, burned hedges, and blackened grass, and a nasty, uncanny silence. The sun was shining bright, and Farmer Giles began to wish that he dared shed a garment or two, and he wondered if he had not taken a pint too many. A nice end to Christmas and all, he thought. And I'll be lucky if it don't prove the end of me too. He mopped his face with a large handkerchief, green, not red, for red rags infuriate dragons, or so he had heard tell. But he did not find the dragon. He rode down many lanes, wide and narrow, and over other farmers' deserted fields, and still he did not find the dragon. Garm was, of course, of no use at all. He kept just behind the mare and refused to use his nose. They came at last to a winding road that had suffered little damage and seemed quiet and peaceful. After following it for a half a mile, Giles began to wonder whether he had not done his duty and all that his reputation required. He had made up his mind that he had looked long and far enough, and he was just thinking of turning back and of his dinner and of telling his friends that the dragon had seen him coming and simply flown away when he turned a sharp corner. There was the dragon lying half across a broken hedge with his horrible head in the middle of the road. Help, said Garm and bolted. The gray mare sat down plump and Farmer Giles went off backwards into a ditch. <clears throat> when he put his head out, there was the dragon, wide awake, looking at him. Good morning, said the dragon. You seem surprised. Good morning, said Giles. I am that. 
Excuse me, said the dragon. He had cocked a very suspicious ear when he caught the sound of rings jingling as the farmer fell. Excuse my asking, but were you looking for me by any chance? No, indeed, said the farmer. Who'd have thought of seeing you here? I was just going for a ride. He scrambled out of the ditch in a hurry and backed away toward the gray mare. She was now on her feet again and was nibbling some grass at the wayside, seeming quite unconcerned. Then we meet by good luck, said the dragon. The pleasure is mine. Those are your holiday clothes, I suppose? A new fashion, perhaps. Farmer Giles' felt hat had fallen off and his gray cloak had slipped open, but he brazened it out. Aye, said he, brand new, but I must be after that dog of mine. He's gone after rabbits, I fancy. I fancy not, said Chrysophylax, licking his lips, a sign of amusement. He will get home uh, a long time before you do, I expect. But pray, proceed on your way, master. Let me see, I don't think I know your name. Nor I yours, said Giles, and we'll leave it at that. As you like, said Chrysophylax, licking his lips again, but pretending to close his eyes. He had a wicked heart, as dragons all have, but not a very bold one, as is not unusual. He preferred a meal that did not have to fight for, but appetite had returned after a good long sleep. The parson of Oakley had been stringy, and it was years since he had tasted a large, fat man. He had now made up his mind to try this easy meat, and he was only waiting until the old fool was off his guard. But the old fool was not as foolish as he looked, and he kept his eye on the dragon, even while he was trying to mount. The mare, however, had other ideas, and she kicked and shied when Giles tried to get up. The dragon became impatient and made ready to spring. Excuse me, said he. Haven't you dropped something? An ancient trick but it succeeded, for Giles had indeed dropped something. When he fell, he had dropped caught a mordax, or vulgarly, tailbiter, and there it lay by the wayside. He stooped to pick it up, and the dragon sprang, but not as quick as tailbiter. As soon as it was in the farmer's hand, it leaped forward with a flash, straight at the dragon's eyes. Hey, said the dragon, and stopped very short. What have you got there? Only tailbiter that was given to me by the king, said Giles. My mistake, said the dragon. <laughs> I beg your pardon. <laughs> he lay and got groveled, and Farmer Giles began to feel more comfortable. I don't think you have treated me fair. How not, said Giles. And anyway, why should I? You have concealed your honorable name and pretended that our meeting was by chance, and yet you are plainly a knight of high lineage. It used, sir, to be the custom of knights to issue a challenge in such cases after a proper exchange of titles and credentials. Maybe it used, and maybe it still is, said Giles, beginning to feel pleased with himself. A man who has a large and imperial dragon groveling before him, may be excused if he feels somewhat uplifted. But you are making more mistakes than one, old worm. I am no knight. I am Farmer Agedius of Ham. I am, and I can't abide trespassers. I've shot giants with my blunderbuss before now for doing less damage than you have, and I issued no challenge, neither. 
The dragon was disturbed. Curse that giant for a liar, he thought. I have been sadly misled. And now, what on earth does one do with a bold farmer and a sword so bright and aggressive? <clears throat> he could recall no precedent for such a situation. Chrysophylax is my name, said he. Chrysophylax the rich? What can I do for your honor? He added ingratiatingly, with one eye on the sword and hoping to escape battle. You can take yourself off, you horny old varmint, said Giles, also hoping to escape battle. I only want to be shut of you. Go right away from here and get back to your own dirty den. He stepped towards Chrysophylax, waving his arms as if he was scaring crows. That was quite enough for Tailbiter. It circled, flashing in the air. Then down it came, smiting the dragon on the joint of the right wing, a ringing blow that shocked him exceedingly. Of course, Giles knew very little about the right methods of killing a dragon, or the sword might have landed in a tenderer spot but Tailbiter did the best it could in inexperienced hands. It was quite enough for Chrysophylax. He could not use his wings for days. Up he got and turned to fly and found that he could not. The farmer sprang on the mare's back. The dragon began to run. So did the mare. The dragon galloped over a field, puffing and blowing. So did the mare. The farmer bawled and shouted as if he was watching a horse race, and all the while he waved a tail biter. The faster the dragon ran, the more bewildered he became, and all the while the gray mare put her best leg foremost and kept close behind him. On they pounded down the lanes and through the gaps in the fences, over many fields and across many brooks. The dragon was smoking and bellowing and losing all sense of direction. At last they came suddenly to the bridge of Ham, thundered over it and came roaring down the village street. There Garm had the impudence to sneak out of an alley and join in the chase. All the people were at their windows or on the roofs. Some laughed and some cheered and some beat tins and pans and kettles and other blue horns and pipes and whistles, and the parson had the church bells rung. Such a to-do, and an ongoing had not been heard in Ham for a hundred years. Just outside the church, the dragon gave up. He lay down in the middle of the road and gasped. Garm came and sniffed at his tail, but Chrysophylax was past all shame. Good people and gallant warrior, he panted as Farmer Giles rode up while the villagers gathered round at a reasonable distance with hay forks, poles, and pokers in their hands. Good people, don't kill me. I am very rich. I will pay for all the damage I have done. I will pay for the funerals of all the people I have killed, especially the parson of Oakley. He shall have a Noble Cenotaph, Cenotaph, though he was rather lean, I will give you each a really good present, if you will only let me go home and fetch it. How much? said the farmer. Well, said the dragon, calculating quickly. He noticed that the crowd was rather large. Thirteen and eight pence each? Nonsense, said Giles. Rubbish, said the people. Rot, said the dog. Two golden guineas each and children half price, said the dragon. What about dogs, said Garn. Go on, said the farmer. We're listening. Ten? Pounds and a purse of silver for every soul, and gold collars for the dogs, said Chrysophylax anxiously. 
Kill him, shouted the people, getting impatient. A bag of gold for everybody and diamonds for the ladies, said Chrysophylax hurriedly. <clears throat> now you're talking, but not good enough, said Farmer Guile. You left out dogs again, said. You left out dogs again, said Garm. What size of bags, said the men. How many diamonds, said their wives. Dear me, dear me, said the dragon. I shall be ruined. You deserve it, said Giles. You can choose between being ruined and being killed where you lie. He brandished Tailbiter, and the dragon cowered. Make up your mind, the people cried, getting bolder and drawing nearer. Chrysophylax blinked. But deep down inside him, he laughed, a silent quiver which they did not observe. Their bargaining had begun to amuse him. Evidently, they expected to get something out of it. They knew very little of the ways of the wide and wicked world. Indeed, there was no one now living in all the realm who had had any actual experience in dealing with dragons and their tricks. Chrysophylax was getting his breath back and his wits as well. He licked his lips. Name your own price, he said. Then they all began to talk at once. Chrysophylax listened with interest. Only one voice disturbed him, that of the blacksmith. No good will come of it, mark my words, said he. A worm won't return, say what you like, but no good will come of it either way. <clears throat> you can stand out of the bargain, if that's your mind, they said to him, and went on haggling, taking little further notice of the dragon. Chrysophylax raised his head, but if he thought of springing on them or of slipping off during the argument, he was disappointed. Farmer Giles was standing by, chewing a straw and considering, but Tailbiter was in his hand, and his eye was on the dragon. You lie where you be, said he, or you'll get what you deserve, gold or no gold. The dragon lay flat. At last, the parson was made spokesman, and he stepped up besides Giles. Vile worm, he said, you must bring back to this spot all of your ill-gotten wealth, and after recompensing those whom you have injured, we will share it fairly among ourselves. Then, if you make a solemn vow never to disturb our land again, nor to stir up any other monster to trouble us. We will let you depart with both your head and your tail to your own home. And now you shall take such strong oaths to return with your ransom, as even the conscience of a worm must hold binding. Chrysophylax accepted after a plausible show of hesitation. He even shed hot tears, lamenting his ruin, till there were steaming puddles in the road. But no one was moved by them. He swore many oaths, solemn and astonishing, that he would return with all his wealth on the feast of St. Hilarius and St. Felix. That gave him eight days and far too short a time for the journey as even those ignorant of geography might well have reflected. Nonetheless, they let him go and escorted him as far as the bridge. To our next meeting, he said as he passed over the river. I am sure we shall all look forward to it. We shall indeed, they said. They were, of course, very foolish. And that will end our story for tonight.